Okay, here's part two of the screencast covering cosmology. After Edwin Hubble discovers the expansion of the universe in the late 1920s, in the 30s and 40s, two theories of cosmology emerge. They are the steady state and the Big Bang. This here is a picture of Fred Hoyle. He was the primary proponent of the steady state theory of cosmology. He was actually also a very important physicist in the development of nuclear physics. Okay, now, the basic idea behind the steady state is as follows. So the steady state assumes that the universe is infinitely large and infinitely old. Yes, the universe is expanding, that's undeniable. However, if you make the assumption that the universe is infinitely large and infinitely old, this then means that matter has to be continuously and spontaneously created over time in order to fill in the gaps, if you will, as the universe expands and keep the universe itself at a constant density. So if you take a look, for example, at the expansion of the universe here with the steady state model, think of each individual dot here as a galaxy, if you will, notice that in order for the density of the universe to remain constant, you have to continuously have matter being created. Now this sounds a little bit strange, but Hoyle mathematically works out exactly how much matter would have to be created to fill in the gaps, and it's not all that much. You would need on the average, per cubic meter of space, one hydrogen atom being created per year in order to keep the density of the universe constant. Okay, now with the Big Bang model of the universe, as the universe expands, it cools and its density decreases over time. So if you think of the individual white dots here as galaxies, the galaxies then get further and further apart as time goes on. Okay, now let's get to this gentleman here. This gentleman, Ralph Alpher, was a graduate student at Princeton University in the 1940s. And he was looking for a topic such that he could obtain his PhD. He was looking for a thesis project. And he looks at Lemaitre's idea of the primeval fireball and he reasons the following. He says, okay, if the universe began as a hot, dense initial point and has been cooling and expanding ever since, measurements of the Hubble constant by that point started to suggest that the universe itself was billions of years old. Therefore, how, what should be the temperature of the universe today if it was cooling down from an initial hot point? So he goes to his thesis advisor, a physicist named George Gamow, and he says, I've got this idea. I want to calculate out exactly how cool the universe should be right now if it began expanding from a hot, dense initial point. So Gamow looks at the idea and he says, that's great. Go ahead and work on that. And then you can do this as your PhD project. So Alpha works out all the mathematical details about what the temperature of the universe should be today. And he ends up with a number of about three degrees above absolute zero, about three degrees Kelvin. In other words, the leftover radiation, if you will, the relic radiation, as it's called, of the Big Bang, should still be around us today. So he writes up the idea, he publishes his paper, ultimately, and he obtains his PhD. Unfortunately, however, Alpher's paper was largely forgotten. And the reason for that is because of a rather cruel joke that was played on him by his thesis advisor, George Gamow. Now look at the names of these two people. You have Alpher and you have Gamow. Well, George Gamow had a friend, another phys physicist named Hans Bethe. Bethe was a physicist like Gamow who worked in nuclear physics. He did most of his work in Europe. At any rate, however, George Gamow thought that it would be a hoot if they can get Hans Bethe to have his name on the paper as well, even though Hans Bethe had nothing to do with Alpher's research and then therefore the paper could be named Alpha Beta Gamma. Well, Hans Beta agreed to this joke and he had his name put on the paper and that's how the paper was published and everybody had a good laugh. Everybody was laughing so much, quite frankly, that they actually forgot what the paper was all about. Most people didn't even bother to read the paper. So Alpha's work languished in obscurity. Okay, now let's flash forward here to the 1960s. When we get to the 1960s, we get to these two engineers who worked for Bell Laboratories, Penzias and Wilson. Their jobs as engineers for Bell Laboratories, this is the old Bell Telephone Company, was to clear up the annoying static that was present in the transmissions of telephone calls that were being placed across the ocean with the first newly launched communications satellites. When those satellites were first launched, there was a large amount of static associated with the phone calls across the continents, 
and their job was to basically get rid of all of that static. In order to do so, they were to be using this telescope right here that you see in the background of the Florida photograph. It's actually a microwave antenna. Their job was basically to collect information from the universe and then see if it was somehow interfering with telephone calls or being placed across from one spot to the other. Well, as they started to make their measurements, what they did discover was that coming from every direction in the sky, and it didn't matter what time of day it was or what time of year, was this annoying background hiss, this annoying, annoying bit of static, and they couldn't figure out exactly where it was coming from. So, in order to basically kind of troubleshoot exactly what it was that they were hearing, they cleaned the entire instrument itself. They actually took the entire antenna apart and cleaned it, put it all back together, and the static was still there. They even went so far as to sweep out the pigeon droppings or the pigeons that were nesting inside the horn of the antenna right here in the hope that that would somehow get rid of the static. Well, it didn't get rid of the static, and ultimately this mystery persisted. They couldn't figure out what was causing it. Well, one of the guys, I think it was Wilson, had a friend at Princeton University, another physicist named Dickey. And Wilson phones Dickey, and he says, guess what? We've got this annoying hiss here in our microwave antenna. We can't figure out where it's coming from. We have no idea what this is. Could you help us out? And Dickey later recounted uh, the telephone call in his memoirs and said that a chill came over him when he heard what Wilson was talking about. And he asks Wilson, he says, okay, what is the temperature of the static in the background that you're picking up? And Wilson says it's three degrees Kelvin. Well, it turns out that Dickey was one of the few people who actually read Alpher's paper. And he said, you know what you've discovered? You've discovered the leftover radiation of the Big Bang. This is called the cosmic microwave background. It's the leftover radiation, the leftover heat, if you will, of the Big Bang itself. Guess what happened to Penzias and Wilson? Penzias and Wilson won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the cosmic microwave background. They won the Nobel Prize by basically tripping over it. What happened to Alpher? Well, Alpher continued to toil in obscurity and he didn't get anything at all. Alpher was actually so disgusted by the entire episode that long before Penzias and Wilson made their discoveries in the 1960s, Alpher had actually left academia completely. And he actually went to work for the Westinghouse Company as an engineer, and he basically spent the rest of his life building washing machines. Okay, now what exactly is the cosmic microwave background? The cosmic microwave background is this background radio noise, if you will, that is coming from every direction in the sky. You can actually measure the temperature of this radiation. As I indicated earlier, the temperature of this radiation is about 3 degrees Kelvin. The Big Bang Theory of Cosmology, Ralph Alpher's work, makes the prediction that the relic radiation, the cosmic microwave background, should exist. And it does. Discovery of the microwave background refutes the steady state theory. The steady state theory makes no such prediction about a cosmic microwave background. And at this point, the steady state theory is discarded. Okay, now when the first measurements of the cosmic microwave background were being made in the 60s and in the 1970s, it appeared to be uniform, uniformly smooth in every direction. It appeared to be all of the same temperature. However, in the 1990s, the first cosmic microwave background explorer satellite was launched. It was basically an extremely sensitive thermometer orbiting the Earth above the atmosphere of the Earth, and the job of this instrument was to measure slight temperature variations in the cosmic microwave background. When you do measure these variations, it produces a map. That's this map right here. This is a map right here of the cosmic microwave background. The first map that was made was made by this particular satellite called the Cosmic Background Exor uh, Explorer. It was in the early 1990s. It basically mapped the cosmic microwave background. It's a low resolution map. Each individual blob that you see right here is actually larger than the full moon in the sky, so it wasn't a very sensitive instrument, but it did detect very minute temperature differentiations in the cosmic microwave background. Those temperature variations are not all that much, just a few ten thousandths of a degree Kelvin. 
Basically, within the cosmic microwave background, there are hot spots. Those are indicated here in pink. And there are cold spots. Those are indicated here in blue. The cold spots, however, are cold enough in the early history of the universe for matter to begin to clump together and ultimately lead to the formations of galaxies and galaxy clusters. A few years after COBE completed its mission back in the 1990s, there were a couple of follow-up missions that basically mapped these temperature fluctuations with a much higher resolution, much more detail, if you will, producing maps, for example, that looked like this. There were two space probes that were launched after COBE, one by the United States called WMAP and another by the Europeans called Planck. Basically, both of these satellites mapped out in much higher resolution the temperature variations of the cosmic microwave background, more detail in the cold spots and the hot spots, if you will. Okay, I kind of picture the cosmic microwave background as kind of like a curtain. It's like a curtain in the sky, if you will, and you look in every single direction in the sky and you see that curtain and light is coming from it. Light of an extremely uh, low temperature, that is at three degrees Kelvin. The light itself dates back to a period of time of only 380,000 years after the moment of initial creation, that is the Big Bang itself. Why does it date back to this time? This is a time, going back in time in the universe, when the universe was cool enough to become transparent. When the universe was cool enough to become transparent, the leftover light or radiation, if you will, of the point of initial expansion then began to move through the universe. So this is light, that has been moving through the universe since this time of 380,000 years after the Big Bang itself. Detailed analysis, detailed analysis on the mapping here of these temperature fluctuations leads to an age of the universe of just under 13.8 billion years, corresponding very nicely with the measurements that I described earlier of the Hubble constant. Okay, let me go ahead and pause this particular screenshot here. And instead, let me exit onto this for now. There we go, like so. And then show you this picture here. This is a space-time diagram of the entire universe. And usually what I do is I actually draw this diagram out on the board and explain it over the course of this lecture. Over here on the right-hand side of the diagram, this is the present day. And then when we look from right to left on the diagram, this is going back in time. Okay, here, here, and here are different telescopes that have been used to look very far back into the universe and then therefore very far back in time. This right here is referred to the Hubble Space Telescope and a particular project associated with it called the Ultra Deep Field. I will explain that a little bit later on. This right here is the COBE satellite and the follow-up WMAP. These two satellites use the telescope, basically a very sensitive thermometer, look back in time to this point here where the universe became transparent just 380,000 years after the Big Bang itself. Okay, now what happened before, that is before the universe became transparent to this point here, the moment of creation, I'll get to that in a later screencast here for this topic. However, for now, from this point here going forward, this is basically what we can see in the universe with our telescopes if they are powerful enough. Okay, now the shape. The shape of this diagram right here is the shape of space-time itself. We have the moment of creation, the initial expansion that happened after that, and then the rate of expansion begins to slow down as time goes on. The universe is still expanding, but it's a small enough universe such that gravity from the galaxies and so forth that have formed is enough to slow down the rate of the expansion itself. But then something happened around five and a half billion years ago. Five and a half billion years ago, for reasons that we don't completely understand, the universe's expansion has been accelerating since that time. What causes this accelerating expansion is referred to as dark energy. Now I'm gonna to have to go ahead and stop this screencast here and continue in a few minutes with a part three.